Welcome everyone, this is Angel Miller with peopleofshambhala.com and uh, this is our first podcast. If you've been reading the website for a while, you'll know pretty much what's in store. Um, this evening we're going to be talking to Joseph Thebus. He's the man behind Alistair Crowley 2012 and uh, he also is a uh, co-producer of Speech in the Silence podcast which is also about Alistair Crowley, magic and related subjects. And we're going to be talking about uh, Alistair Crowley. Uh, we're also going to be discussing his uh, philosophy of Thelema, especially uh, in regard to politics. Uh, what is the Thelemic alternative? Uh, and we're also going to be uh, looking at censorship, especially in Britain, uh, where it's recently been uh, revealed that the government has asked uh, internet service providers there to uh, uh, censor, quote-unquote, esoteric material. Joseph Thebus, uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, it's great, great to hear from you. And so I, I came across you um, last year, not surprisingly, because you were behind the uh, Alistair Crowley or AC 2012, which I thought was a, it was a great bit of fun, but it also made uh, some serious points along the way. And uh, so first of all, maybe you could just tell me how you became uh, uh, interested in Crowley or interested in the esoteric and what, what led you to uh, set up uh, AC212? Sure, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I, well, I guess I've been interested in esoteric subjects since a very young age. Um, I think um, some of my earliest memories as a child of around five to seven years old, I, I remember seeking out things um, about ESP and things like that that, you know, I didn't really know anything about esotericism, of course, at that age, but I was interested in understanding things that may be beyond our normal sensory um, experience. And, uh, and so from that point, um, I was interested in, and kind of sought out information about such things. Um, and um, I guess it was in my teens, I, you know, like a lot of teenagers, was very interested in uh, role-playing games and, and games in general, and I like to play chess as well as Dungeons and Dragons and things like that, and Call of Cthulhu is one that uh, I played for a while, and, and, uh, and then I picked up this card game called Illuminati, which was put out by Steve Jackson Games, okay. and, uh, <laughs> and that, um, it was, there's actually, there's a new kind of card game based on that that it's, it's not the same, um, but there was an older one that was more like a kind of a card game of dominoes in a way, but the idea was to, um, you know, you start off as one of these various Illuminati groups, whether it's the Bavarian Illuminati or the Discordians or, or what have you, and, and each, each Illuminati had its own goal, and you have to try to take over the world, and it was kind of a fun game, uh, but the whole like, idea of Illuminati was kind of new to me at the time, and, and I noticed in the rule book that there was this bibliography at the end. And in my you know, 14 year old consciousness, I, I was like, wow, the Illuminati is real. And, um, <laughs> and so I started looking for some of these nonfiction books that appeared in the, in the bibliography of this, of this game. Oh, okay. And uh, one of, you know, a lot of the books that were in there were by folks like Robert Anton Wilson okay. and Tim Leary. And so I, yeah. I uh, came across Robert Anton Wilson's Cosmic Trigger. The Final Secret of the Illuminati at a university bookstore um, shortly thereafter and immediately picked it up and read it and had my mind blown. Uh, I had been raised Roman Catholic okay. and uh, so very soon after that um, sort of more embraced agnosticism. Um, okay. and, uh, and of course Wilson kind of introduced me to the names Aleister Crowley and Timothy Leary and a lot of other, um, you know, Alfred Korzybski and so on. And, uh, and John Lilly, and so I started kind of looking at, you know, what are the books that, that Wilson read, and, and kind of branched out from there, and I, I picked up Aleister Crowley's um, Book of the Law, and Book of Thoth, and a few others um, back then, and okay. I didn't, it was really hard for me to kind of wrap my head around it, as I guess yeah. it probably is for a lot of people yeah. starting out, <laughs> and, uh, but but I kept kind of kept at it and read um, Israel Regardi's works and, and his biography of Aleister Crowley or, okay. or his psych, psychoanalysis of Aleister Crowley and and, uh, and kind of was doing kind of my own work um, studying the the, uh, the big red book of the Golden Dawn uh, magic. Um, oh really? Okay. And, and uh, one, right. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, 
so I was kind of doing some of my own work and, and practice, and um, and I was I was also studying at the time, kind of not connected to my interest in, in Robert Anton Wilson or Alison Crowley. I was also interested in the works of Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell and that kind of stuff. I was interested okay. in mythology and dreams yeah. and psychology and and uh, and so I, I had the sense that there was a way to go through kind of a, a rite of passage or, or you know, begin an inward journey where, whereby I would simultaneously, you know, come to know myself as well as, um, you know, enter into a kind of universal brotherhood with, with other people who are also seeking to know themselves. Mm-hmm. And so I, so I started very early, like around 15, looking for something like that. And I had read about uh, Ordo Templi Orientis and Freemasonry and Golden Dawn and all this other stuff. And I, I, you know, I was growing up in Montana, so there wasn't really any of the more um, exotic things, but there was Freemasonry, and, and there was um, De Malay, which is sort of a, a yeah. junior junior Freemasonic order. Mm-hmm. And I, I joined De Malay at, um, I believe I was 15 when I joined De Malay. Uh, I was very, very active in that, and um, you know, performed initiatory rituals and things like that. I was also, at the time, interested in drama, and I was actually a thespian in my high school, and actually got my high school letter in drama, um, and I, I was actually interested in drama in part because of its connection to esoteric traditions and religious traditions going all the way back to the ancient Greeks. Yeah. Um, and so, so initiation as a, a form of dramatic ritual was very interesting to me. Okay. Um, and so I, I did that, and then uh, when I became of age, I, I joined Freemasonry. Okay. Um, and went through the first three degrees of that, but yeah. kind of lost interest because I felt that, um, I don't know, and I guess it varies depending on where you are, but where I was, it seemed like everybody was there to, to trade business cards. Oh, and, really? okay. and they didn't really seem to take the, the rituals all that seriously or, or think of them in any kind of esoteric way. And, and uh, they all kind of seemed to think I was a little odd for, for having interests outside of just, you know, making social connections. So, um, so I kind of stopped being active in that and, and kind of cultivated my own group of friends who kind of wrote our own rituals and had our own seasonal celebrations and things okay. like that. <laughs> um, so like then, fun. Okay. yeah, exactly, and, and did that for many years until uh, I guess in my mid twenties, I, I moved okay. to Portland, Oregon for uh, right. for job opportunity. Yeah. Um, and, and while I was here, um, I realized that I had left my whole group of friends <laughs> at home. Yeah. Who, who were interested in the stuff that I was into, and I was like, God, I wonder where I can meet other people like this who are who have these interests. And then I remembered my long ago interest in OTO, which I didn't, I still didn't know if it existed or not, or if it did, whether it was legitimate. Um, but by that point, the internet had come to full flower, okay. and I was I was able to actually go on Google and do a search, and within a couple of days, made contact with Ordo Templi Orientis. Um, and I basically dove in head first. I, I went to a Gnostic Mass right off the bat, and something about seeing it in the flesh rather than just on the printed page yeah. really made everything kind of click for me. And, um, and talking with people also, I had a lot of conversations with, with people who were longtime Thelemites at that point. Mm-hmm. And kind of was able to ask them questions that I couldn't really ask of a, of a book unless right. I really kind of memorized the book. Mm-hmm. So um, so I, you know, very quickly realized that everything that I had been um, holding close to my heart as my own values and interests since starting to read Robert Anton Wilson and Timothy Leary and, and Alistair Crowley um, was, you know, the core of the work of the OTO and, and their initiatory work. And, and they really took the initiatory work very seriously, and they put that as as uh, being a, of importance more so than trading business cards or you know making those sort of business connections with each right, other. Right. And that was that was like that's exactly the kind of priority I want to see in a magical order. Yeah. So um, so I I jumped right in, and even before I took initiation, I was active in um, working on the um, one of Aleister Crowley's rites of Eleusis, which was a series of dramatic rituals he wrote for the public. And um, as well yeah. as getting baptized in the uh, the Ecclesia Gnostica Catholica, which is sort of the the ecclesiastical part of OTO, um, which you can actually get involved in prior to initiation. Okay. 
and baptized in that, and just really dove in head first. And I was really motivated to, um, you know, because of my experience having been isolated in, in a relatively rural area, um, I it, it, I was very motivated to make um, c kind of make Thelema and OTO more accessible in some way, um, easier to find and. Uh, you know, help people who might not know how to approach it to find out how to approach it. Okay. So, so ever since then, I've I've worked very very hard and really devoted the bulk of my time to to accomplishing that end. Mm. Okay, um, great. So, so you asked about how I got into Alistair Crowley 2012 or got the idea to do Alistair Crowley. Yeah. Um, I can go on to that, or if you have questions about. Um, yeah, one thing I wouldn't mind um, knowing is uh, you, you mentioned uh, Freemasonry and you found it a bit empty in Montana uh -huh. um, but uh, and free and Crowley himself was a, a Freemason and, and joined uh, several different rites uh, pretty much around well I guess in uh, South America and France and uh, right. was, was pretty involved in it so do you have any thoughts about that uh, with the disconnect there or mm -hmm. well um, yeah I guess um, it, it seems to me that, uh, that it depends on where, where you go as far yeah. as, um, I, in fact, since I've been in Portland, I've become aware of there, there's an esoteric kind of research um, lodge of Freemasonry here. Okay. Uh, but I, I still am not that interested in, in uh, Freemasonry as an organization. I mean, I certainly yeah. study, study the rituals uh, because right. they are fantastic. But as an organization, I'm not super interested in it just because... Um, it, it kind of runs counter to some, some of my um, my values. I don't I don't you know have any problem with them doing their thing, but I just don't necessarily want to be a part of it because mainly you know the fact that they don't allow women as members, mm -hmm. uh, which is absolutely their right. Um, it's just not something I'm interested in, and um, yeah. the fact that they require a belief in a supreme being is is and and they kind of I think that they they tend to really focus that on the three you know. Um, Abrahamic <laughs> kinds of ideas of what a supreme being is. Yeah. Um, I, I think that probably uh, varies a lot, actually. I mean, I think, I think, it, yeah, I think in larger cities, uh, it would be entirely up to the individual what that was. I mean, I think if you're in a very conservative backwater town, that, that's almost certainly right. true. What right. you're saying, but yeah, I think it varies. But uh, uh -huh. yeah. uh, there, there is, you know, there's a. I don't. I am. I'm, I'm not going to um, talk about the specific contents of rituals, but I know that you know having gone through initiation that they do have a, a question that comes up in the in the context of initiation about that and I, I think that my answer uh, regardless of where it was <laughs> would okay. would not would not fly <laughs> okay, okay, but, right. but, but no I, I, I get what you're saying and you know if I were to say something like oh well, the universe is God or, or that kind of thing but I really believe that there is no God but each individual okay Person. And so, if someone were to ask me, you know, what is who is your God? I would say, you know, myself with a capital S. Um, so that that might not be something that they would totally get um, if I were to answer in the context of ritual. Yeah, maybe. Um, okay. <laughs> and and the the Ordo Templi Orientis itself actually started as a sort of extra Masonic rite uh, uh, in Germany. That's, yeah, that's right. Um, uh, back, you know, kind of pre Crowley. Um, yeah. Carl Kelmer and Theodore Royce were doing it was like yeah it was very much like they were trying to gather a lot of the the extra Masonic rites um, yeah uh, but it was really kind of it really kind of existed mainly on paper yeah um, that's right I don't think it ever really got any uh, recognition in fact I'm sure I didn't get any recognition from Freemasonry in Germany so right well and I don't I don't think they had any real activities I mean I don't think they were doing yeah. initiations or anything like that so okay. And so, uh, so um, Crowley, two twelve. Oh um, yeah, so so Alistair Crowley, twenty twelve. Um, I guess I first became interested in that. Well, throughout my adult life, I've never voted for either of the Republican or Democratic candidates for, okay. for president. Yeah. And um, and I because I've always been very, um, I guess you could say cynical, but maybe disillusioned by. Um, the, the political process in this country, and I mean at the, the national level and really at the level of the, the presidency, and, and today even at the level of Congress, it seems like mm -hmm. um, it's it seems a little bit um, like kabuki theater to me. 
Um, I think that, um, you know, especially it's been very apparent since the, the I guess, the early 90s um, when we went to war in the, in the Gulf at the, to begin with and then, you know, going through um, Clinton and then Bush Jr. And, and now Obama, it seems like there has been a very consistent program of, um, you know, meddling with other countries and, and, uh, and I'm really not for that. And, and there's a lot of things that have been going on in those, you know, 20 years, um, including, you know, a gradual um, erosion of, of our civil rights and things like that. And, and so I've always been, you know, looking for those third party candidates or, um, or what have you who are going to come in and actually offer real change. But I think it was, uh, it was Emma Goldman who said that if, if voting could change anything, it would be illegal. Um, I think that, um, you know, that's kind of been my perspective for a long time. And, and so running up to the 2000, uh, 2008 election, when uh, it was, it was uh, you know, Obama was, was very popular among a lot of people that I knew. Yeah. But I, I really had a, a very much uh, more cynical view of Obama, and I felt from early on in his campaigning that, that he was not earnest about about his desires to, for example, um, you know, reverse the um, the uh, NSA spying that um, that we now know he certainly did not reverse, um, right. or like pulling us out of Iraq or, or things like that. I, I just didn't buy it, uh, yeah. and a lot of people that I knew did, and, and uh, you know, but uh, but I I told some friends of mine that I wasn't planning to vote at all because I felt that. Um, uh, that there wasn't going to be, you know, anybody that I would vote for would not make it, mm. and um, and I didn't want to support the system of voting by, um, you know, when when I say the system of voting, what I mean is I think that, um, you know, when people vote for someone, it's kind of a small psychological investment that they make in that person, and that yeah. then, then they feel later that they have to defend that person's decisions and actions, even if they might be things that they disagree with. Yeah, <laughs> that's definitely true. Definitely. Uh, yeah, and I think we've seen that, you know, in the case of Obama and the people who have been anti-war, um, you know, then defending Obama, saying that we should stay there. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I just didn't want to. I didn't want to invest. I didn't want to feel that compulsion to defend somebody that who I really disagreed with. And so I, I wasn't planning to vote at all. And somebody said to me, "Well, you know, why don't you just vote for whoever you think you." would be good as a president, regardless of if they have any chance of winning. And I immediately thought of Aleister Crowley. Um, and I realized that, I, that that's who I was going to vote for immediately. And I, and I started thinking about it. Um, and, you know, the idea occurred to me that it would be interesting to have uh, kind of a, a, a parody campaign, you know, like we've seen with parody campaigns of Mickey Mouse or... or um, right. What, well, who's the other one? Uh, Vermin Supreme or... Um, uh, yeah, so I, or C Cthulhu is also one that's been kind of uh, brought out. And so I thought that would be kind of funny to have an Aleister Crowley campaign, but it was pretty late in the election cycle at that point. So I did vote for Aleister Crowley for, uh, for president in 2008, and then I started thinking about actually putting together a campaign. And I thought, wow, this is really great because Aleister Crowley, you know, and the year 2012 at that point, everybody was, you know, freaked out about the whole Mayan pseudo prophecy. It wasn't actually a Mayan prophecy, yeah. but. The, you know, the, um, the whole thing about the end of the world in 2012, and I thought it's a perfect pair, you know, if, if the world's going to end in 2012, why not vote for Aleister Crowley in November of 2000, or, yeah, in, in November, when it's going to end in December, so, um, so anyway, yeah, I thought it's a perfect pairing, and I immediately set up a website, I think I had it up by, by um, you know, early 2009, or I guess it was, it was about, actually, no, I think it was October of 2009, I had it set up, okay. and, uh, and yeah, I guess, you know, it's a combination, it, there, there's a lot of uh, things on that site, including a lot of humor, because um, I thought that was really important, given that it is a, a, sat, a satirical or parody website. Um, but underneath it all, there is, yeah, kind of a serious message, in the sense that, you know, I think a lot of the uh, parody candidates like Mickey Mouse or Cthulhu are pure, purely humorous, you know, that there's no serious message other than you know, being generally dissatisfied with the, the options that are out there. While Aleister Crowley, to me, is, um, there, there's a real serious thing under it in the sense that if enough people were to 
voted for Aleister Crowley to where it actually got noticed by the media, it would completely blow people's minds. I mean, they would be like, what? Why, is, why are people voting for Aleister Crowley? And I thought, well, if that happens through the efforts of my campaign and people end up doing a, a web search to find out, I want to have plenty of material on my site that actually talks about Aleister Crowley's philosophies and kind of spread the information that way because he's been so slandered for so long. There's so much misunderstanding about his philosophies out there that yeah. I really see this is a, a way to kind of kind of present uh, some information that would be educational for, for people. Um, and it actually has, you know, gotten quite a bit of attention, you know, as far as these things go. Um, of course, uh, the, the votes weren't, um, weren't enough to gain media attention immediately after the election or anything. Um, but kind of one of the, the taglines was, um, you know, all we need is 1% because if, if Alistair Crowley got 1% of the vote, um, it would be all over the news. Yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> and um, so uh, perhaps you could just uh, talk a little bit about how, how you would envision a, a Thelemic uh, government. Sure, sure. Or well, state or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I think that the, the main thing with Thelema is that it it's... It would really, in terms of how it would be applied to politics, it would it would put the the liberty of the individual as the supreme principle upon which all questions of policy would be based. Right. And and that I think is is different than any of the political parties, including libertarians, in the sense that um, you know I think when we we look at these kind of political theories, whether it's the 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 political theories of, of right and left, or you know, Democrats or Republicans or Libertarians, or even just more general political theories like democracy, communism, socialism, capitalism, all these things, they, they all kind of tend to take on the qualities of, um, of a kind of ideal uh, where, people, where people even feel like they have to be loyal to that ideal above all else. And so, yeah. You know, in the general political discourse, people will say, well, does this promote democracy? Um, as though democracy were the thing that we were all, you know, that was so important. But democracy is only good because of what it accomplishes, right? Right, right. Uh, cool. so, so the question is, well, is democracy actually accomplishing those things that it purports to accomplish? And, and I think that what the message of Thelema, and, and Alistair Crowley even said something to this effect, that, that Thelema is is beyond all of these ideologies and and it can be used to justify any of them mm. um, and and I think that it you know by saying we're not interested in, in any idea particular ideal and then making ourselves fit that ideal instead we want to know whether the ideals are fitting us and and really you know helping us as individuals to to accomplish our inmost nature and and to to make manifest our ourselves in the world, and so, um, so you see, like Aleister Crowley's, he's written a few political essays, and and he's written about politics in the context of other things, and, and he's he's you know had political views that kind of run the spectrum of you know right to left. You know, he, he both uh, he said that he felt that everyone has a, a basic right to to basic health care, for example. He says that everybody. There should be a minimum wage that not only you know covers cost of living but allows people to make investments. Right. Uh, and he, but at the same time, on the other side, he was also very against uh, traffic lights <laughs> because, he, because he felt that they were an encroachment on individual liberty. And, and it's funny because even recently there have been studies that that uh, and there are, there are cities around the world that that don't have traffic lights and they actually have fewer accidents. So it's kind of a, oh, really? it's like, that's interesting. Um, because people are paying more attention, um, right, right. The, but uh, but but yeah. So and of course he, he spoke against communism. He spoke against socialism as well. Of course that that's also um, you know, there was a particular um, kind of political thing going on with those those ideologies yeah. at that time. Yeah. Um, which he may feel slightly differently now about that, but I don't right. know. He, he the basic idea though is that um, Thelema. Um, exalts the liberty of the individual as the, the supreme principle and then so the question is you look at each policy and you ask does this actually help individuals and I think you have to ask that question 
in the context of the time and place where it's being brought up. Um, you know, a policy in, in one place and time may be liberating, but in another place and time could be oppressive. And so I think it's, it's, uh, that, that's the kind of thing we would see in a Thelemic state. And with Thelema, um, you know, just in terms of the basic idea of the liberty of the individual, of course that implies that we don't uh, interfere with the liberty of other individuals, including, you know, doing anything that would, cause, that would be violent or that kind of thing. So, right. so it's not just a, an anarch, anarchistic principle um, where, you know, everybody just runs around and it's Mad Max. Um, right, it's right. Like, it's more like, um, you know, you do your will and you leave everybody else alone and to do their will, live and let live. Mm. Uh, and so there, it, it's not like there wouldn't be police. I mean, there would be police who would, you know, make sure that people aren't beating each other up or, or right. killing each other or, or that kind of thing. Mm. But, for example, drugs would be perfectly legal because that's, you know, a victimless kind of thing mm. uh, to engage in. And, and you mentioned, um, you know, Curly was opposed to communism, socialism, whatever he imagined or right. believed that to be. And, uh, you know, one of the, the buzzwords today and for those ideologies and since, since the French Revolution, and in a way it's sort of the buzzword of the modern era, and that is equality. And one of the things, I, and you know, and not discriminating against people on sort of ridiculous arbitrary reasons is, is certainly a, a positive thing. But uh, I think one of the things that gets lost or has got lost along the way is the idea of quality. Like, what about the quality of uh, life of individuals? And d does that feature in um, the Lima, do you think? Uh, the quality of life, yes. I mean, I think that the, you know, his whole idea was to help people to, the, the function of government, I, mean, I don't think he specifically said this in, in so many words, but I, my I, understanding of his opinion was that the function of government should be to help everyone or, or be there to facilitate everyone's doing their own will right. or, or to be out of the way so that they can and, depending on the situation. Right, right. So that's why he would say, for example, that, that there should be minimum wage and that yeah. make sure that that happens. Or, you know, having uh, welfare for pregnant mothers, for example, or um, yeah. what have you. So, go ahead. And, 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 you know, that's a good example you bring up, min minimum wage. And I think today that, that would be justified on the basis of quote-unquote equality. But wouldn't it be better to justify it on the basis of quality? Because then you ha actually have some kind of uh, measure to see if people are, are doing well or not. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think that as far as, you know, equality goes, there's, you know, there's a couple different um, perspectives on what equality means, whether it's yeah. that everyone is equal or that everyone should have equal opportunity, or that everyone has equal rights. Yeah. And I, I kind of think more along the, the lines of the latter, because certainly, of course, everybody's different. Um, yeah. Everybody has different different abilities and, and different different yeah. uh, challenges. Absolutely. Um, and and I think, but I do think that we all should have equal opportunities. Yeah. And I think that uh, that that Crowley felt that too. And I think that in the, in a sense, he felt that at, at, at our essence, at our core. Um, that, that all people are essentially identical in the sense that we're all sovereign, divine individuals mm -hmm. who have uh, certain rights. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, of course, uh, we all have different uh, skills and different abilities, and some people are more physical, some people are more uh, intellectual, more artistic. And in a way, you sort of, I think uh, you do need a, a state that sort of uh, allows those things to... Uh, uh, flourish really, yes, and, exactly. and not kind of try and stamp them down. But, uh, right, right yeah. exactly. And I think that there are, you know, I mean, I think that some people do in, in government and, and so forth do, um, you know, seek that. And, and I and one of the things that that Crowley kind of predicted, um, or or he he envisioned for a thelemic state, which is actually you actually see it now in in the United States anyway, and I think probably uh, many other developed countries as well is that the government does have um, some aspects where it will attempt to assist people in finding out what their uh, calling is. I mean, right, you know, right. You see, for example, psychological testing or mm. you know, little quizzes you can take to find out what your career aptitudes are and things like that. Yeah. And I think that, that kind of thing is something Crowley would definitely approve of. But I think also Crowley would suggest that, uh, that there be, uh, he never said this, but my, my conjecture is that he he would support government programs for, you know, um, psychedelic self-exploration, for example. 
Um, <laughs> and, you know, and Timothy Leary really felt that he was continuing the work of Aleister Crowley, and I, yeah. I think he's right about that. Mm. Yeah. Well, on on that note of drugs, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you saw recently, but uh, I think today or yesterday it's been uh, revealed that the British government has, um, has instructed internet service providers to uh, install filters that will filter out uh, dubious uh, websites, you know, uh, regarding say uh, pornography, anorexia sites, or drugs. And some, you know, some of them you can certainly see why. You know, I I don't particularly think it's a good idea for people to be looking on suicide or anorexia sites. But, but you know, on the other hand, there's a very peculiar uh, bracket that it, that they've been told to filter out, and that is quote unquote uh, esoteric material. I know, I have seen that. <laughs> it's insane. I mean, it's really, yeah. it's the thin edge of the wedge, you know? And yeah, this well, is, in, in a way, ahead. you know, the thin end of the wedge may be the stuff that we find, uh, that we actually really do object to, and then from there it all spreads out, and I think we, we, you have to be very careful about the censorship in that, all, you know, any anything that's censored or, or made illegal in terms of opinions especially, uh, uh-huh. you know, then the definition will always be broadened to encompass an enormous amount of material but this is particularly interesting that's what I think it is and you know it, it's it's surprising to see it um, I, I saw someone post the the link to to uh, an article about this uh, I think I saw it first yesterday or, or the day before and uh, and I think they just posted it saying oh you know look they're gonna start censoring our our things by default and I just looked at the article really quick and then I saw esoteric materials yeah like what is objectionable about esoteric materials, and and it's really kind of unsettling and uh, and, and uh, amazing in some ways that that a, a developed country like the UK would do something like it this. Is, and I, it is. Some some of my friends in the in the UK mentioned like it's surprising that this happened on this side of the Atlantic first, <laughs> which is yeah. kind of funny. <laughs> but um, but you know it's it's interesting too because uh, in France and in Germany there have been. Um, you know, political movements to suppress um, new religious movements. Uh, right, right. Yeah. France and Germany. I don't know the, all the details, but I know that France and Germany both, at, at one time, if not if not presently, had a list of various uh, new religious organizations that they were kind of watching and they were concerned about. And I think it was motivated mainly by by bad experiences that they had had with Scientology, mm-hmm. um, and they kind of you know started worrying about all these different new religious movements and and uh, and that's you know I think that that was really unfortunate I think they're a little bit less worried about that now and I think it kind of also went along with the whole satanic panic of the the, okay. what was it, the 90s and yeah, you know, the United States yeah. but I think it, it kind of lasted a little bit longer in, in Europe and uh, right, right. In the Pacific and Australia and stuff but, um, but yeah so it's it's interesting to see this come up in, in England which hadn't at that point um, any kind of list or anything like that and I, I kind of had always thought of the UK as being particularly uh, uh, liberal with respect to religious freedoms and uh, yeah well, so that, well that that's also what's so fascinating about it that you know if you turn on British TV or you listen to the politicians they're forever going on about our uh, you know our rainbow landscape of uh, all these different religions and yet at the same time you know if you're serious about one of those religions now and you want to research presumably even you know esoteric Hinduism or esoteric Islam or now you you know there's gonna be filters to bring. Uh-huh. yeah exactly and it's amazing too because you know uh, Freemasonry is going to be affected by this and Freemasonry is such yeah, a yeah um, it's it's so big in, in the UK but I understand that they have um, there has also been some anti-Masonic sentiment there. Yeah, so. the, that that definitely comes and goes, and it was particularly bad for about ten years, uh, up until about uh, I guess the first blockbuster hit of Dan Brown, which I don't think is entirely coincidental. I think at that point it's, you start to look ridiculous if you're trying to ban <laughs> Freemasonry. It's been portrayed as this sort of interesting mystical society. Right. But, uh, it was really, yeah, it was definitely, it was in the, in the papers a, a lot at one point. And, uh, for example, the uh, the Freemasons there had to, uh, if they had to register with the police if they were a Freemason and they worked in, for the government in most wow. capacities. And, uh, you know, it should be said, and, you know, I don't want to compare the British government to the Nazi party, that would be ridiculous. <laughs> but, 
you know, that is the first thing that the Nazi party did. And it is also the first thing that most totalitarian governments have done, including, you know, even in the Middle East, you know. And uh, when people are being put on lists uh, for joining some uh, group, then, uh, I mean, it won't stop there. Certainly the other groups will be uh, added to that and added to that and so on. Uh, Luckily, the, the European Court of Human Rights pointed out that it was illegal and eventually that had some effect but uh, uh-huh. it's it is a it is kind of troubling really yes it is interesting yeah 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 mm. well um and I, I think that there have been a number of people who've been starting to uh, organize uh, some protests against this uh this new um, proposed uh program in, in the uk um, i oh, really? I've seen some friends of mine in, in the uk online have been uh, getting organized, uh, building a website. I think they already have a, a Facebook page, for okay. example, uh, kind of getting everybody, you know, under you know, various uh, esoteric traditions uh, to uh, to kind of come together to fight this. Um, and I think that, that would be very, very good to... Yeah. Maybe, maybe I'll send you a link to... Uh, and maybe you can post it up um, oh, yeah, a lot. Definitely. Yeah. And, you know, obviously you do think of uh, Western esotericism as esoteric, but, you know, again, there, there are, there is esoteric Hinduism, there is esoteric Islam, there is esoteric yeah. Christianity. And it's sort of bizarre that in a way that you, implicitly they would be going after the most uh, sort of spiritual ends of the religions, really. But, yeah, that's, uh, a, that's a very interesting point. Yeah. But at the same time, it does seem to be that uh, governments and news, the media and uh, and authorities often tend to prefer the sort of more radical political end. But maybe because they, you know, they have to can deal with them on a political level, which is maybe more comfortable in a way than dealing with people on a more spiritual level. Actually, yeah, that's a good point and interesting, um, and especially in these days when there's so much um, polemic out there, uh, sort of against religion and. General, um, yeah. and uh, you know, just seeing this sort of um, false dichotomy being presented of you know you're either into science or you're into religion, and um, you, you right. either are you know, you're either an atheist and intelligent or you're an idiot and religious. <laughs> you know, like all of this kind of um, uh, false dichotomy that's out yeah. there. It's, uh, so it's interesting to see that um, maybe that you know that has uh, something to do with people's level of discomfort with. The, the most sort of spiritual side of religious traditions. Yeah, and um, you know, you're mentioning uh, the sort of fragmentation of uh, of society in a certain way, and I think one of the things I notice is that uh, even in politics itself, it seems to be it's almost like a sort of psychological problem that we're seeing. That, uh, I don't know if lately if you've seen, but uh, there've been a couple of studies done uh, saying that. You know, you're more likely to be right wing if you have uh, bigger muscles. Uh, or and uh, and there was another study saying that uh, Republican women were more feminine. And and then of course this was chalked up to being that. Well, that must mean that there's some kind of psychological issue there, or something ah. like that. And and it just strike me that um, I I mean I slightly wonder if uh, politics isn't somewhat divided. A, Almost along sort of school lines, where you have the sort right. of <laughs> the jocks. The jocks. And the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think there's something to that. I mean, I think that there has been, especially in the United States, at least there has yeah. been um, a, a very long uh, tradition of this kind of divide between the eggheads and yeah. the jocks. Yeah. Um, and you know, I mean, I think that uh, you know, there's people who are you know they, they see themselves as hard-working Americans, but they're yeah. they're not intellectual, uh, right. you know, and so that, yeah, I think that's been a very, very long divide, yeah. deep divide between uh, between Americans and yeah. AI. It doesn't yeah. surprise me that that's kind of manifesting in the political world, and maybe that's kind of how the, how people are sorting themselves into these two yeah. parties. <laughs> yeah, and um, uh, earlier on you mentioned that you would say that your God is yourself with a capital S. Which is, in a way, it's a very uh, Hindu, you know, the, the same term is used in the Bhagavad Gita. And, yeah. um, you know, that's actually some, uh, not in that, not in the sense that you mean necessarily, but, but the, you know, the self or the Chinese notion of the higher man, Chun Tzu, is a, is, it's really what uh, people of Shambhala is really about, trying to cultivate that. And, uh, and in contrast to this sort of very fragmented sort of uh, society or, or person where you're either an intellectual or a physical person, you know the Chun Tzu or the self uh, is um, 
someone who is uh, traditionally is uh, experienced in the arts in a physical culture such as you know martial arts or archery or something like that but also in maybe painting poetry uh, philosophy rhetoric and it strikes me that that for society to move forward it almost has to go back to the people uh, 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 really looking at that as the role model and I think Crowley whether he fits that mold or not will probably I'm guessing would agree and I would say this, you know, that when you look at uh, Western politicians today and you listen to the, the political campaigns and the way it's reported, it's almost like a sort of sporting event, like tactics, not pr principles or values, but it seems that these people are not particularly impressive most of the time, especially so if you think about them in the light of the, the, this notion of the higher man, which is in all societies, as far as I'm aware, all civilizations. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree. I think that, um, you know, um, sort of this, um, this idea that we are, um, at our core, um, a, a very, you know, spiritual being and that out we, you know, we make our way in the world through perfecting our, ourselves and ourselves with the lower S. Um, and I think that, that, you know, Alistair Crowley attempted to explore all of the different paths of of improving his his ability as a human being, um, you know, yeah. he, he was a chess player, a mountaineer. He yeah. paint, painted and wrote poetry, and um, and he was also studied in chemistry and, and so forth. So, um, so yeah, I think that you know that, that kind of idea of a of a Renaissance person maybe um, is is very prevalent among yes. people who study esotericism because yeah. they want to they really develop every aspect of their being. That's right. the key, and I, I think that that focus, or even an awareness of developing every aspect of one's being, is completely absent in, in the political discourse we have. Today. Yeah, and and do you think that we need that, or, or, or would we have that in a thelemic state? Do you think? Or? Oh, absolutely, and that would be you know that would be the core idea in a thelemic state that that everyone um, be free first of all to to develop every aspect of their being. Right, um, right. And, and also that government, you know, A, doesn't interfere with that process, yeah. and, and B, any programs it does have are designed to support that process. So. Right, right. So, so in a way, that I guess, you know, I was wondering what's the difference between Thelema and, say, libertarianism. And I, uh -huh. and, and I guess from what you're saying, the difference would be that, as, uh, from what I know of libertarianism, that that's just... Uh, you, you can be free from the government, whereas I'm guessing from what you're saying, Thelema is uh, being uh, free to uh, excel in a way, free to develop yourself to the highest right. limit. Right, exactly, and, and you know, just um, I think that the libertarianism um, just focuses on um, on the the aspect of, of no interference. Um, right. And yeah. Doesn't doesn't look at well. What's the point of not having interference? The point of not having interference yeah. is so that you can do and be everything that you want to be. And if if a lack of of involvement is actually a, can also be a form of, of interference. You know. I mean. I think that yeah. When we look at um, you know some of the libertarian candidates that have you know, been around in, in in recent times that um, you know that it seems like they would want freedom for corporations to run roughshod over the individual as well, you yeah. know, they certainly wouldn't support minimum wage or welfare for no, new mothers, no. um, so, so yeah, I think that you're, you're exactly right about the difference between yeah. libertarianism and Thelema. Yeah, and I think you're right about libertarianism, that is the downfall where it essentially does grant uh, liberty to, for, for real sort of abuses, unfortunately. Right, right. Uh, which is the one big problem with it, probably. But, yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Well, it's been uh, great speaking with you. Do, you. do you have anything else you'd like to share? Um, uh, no, I don't think so. Um, just, uh, um, I guess I'll, I'll kind of maybe plug my, my podcast. Um, I am a co-producer of a podcast called Speech in the Silence, which uh, is, is all about Thelema, and, um, and I can send you a link for that. Oh, um, yeah, do. So, yeah, so thank you so much for having me on. Oh, great. It's been great speaking to you. Thanks very much.